So, dear colleagues, uh, warm welcome to everybody in this third live webinar. Uh, this webinar is the opening uh, of a series of online discussions. In this and the upcoming three meetings, we will commonly analyze the important features of a fire rate module. Uh, as, I as I have emphasized and emphasized now, uh, the benefits of these uh, webinars uh, are greater for those who are prepared uh, by analyzing the man uh, manuals and introductory videos presented in the website and also the cases uh, previously exposed on the virusite.com. Uh, so I ask you again uh, to answer the questions presented in the poll. Uh, as in all polls, uh, the system does not allow to identify uh, the person who bought it. Uh, this time uh, we discuss uh, two features that define our first impressions of a nodule. Okay. You have to see now a PowerPoint presentation. Is it okay? Do you see it? Yes, it's okay. Yes, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, uh, the first uh, two uh, features which we discuss uh, is uh, the nodule composition and nodule equigenicity. And it is more about uh, impression. In fact, in most cases, these two features alone determine whether the nodule should be sampled or not. Uh, but before starting with this, I should warn you. In the upcoming events, uh, we will discuss eight characteristics of a nodule. In most of them, we lack biological standard. Therefore, we could rely on interpretation of patterns. A uniform interpretation uh, can be based on exact definitions. As you will see, we lack such level of definitions. So be aware, all interpretations, including my judgment, can be and should be debated. So first about nodule composition. I highlight four themes, the definition, the influence of aspiration, the echogenic figures related to cystic degeneration, and finally, I will speak about the importance of cystic nodules. The composition and echogenicity rely on two different features of the nodule. The composition relies on the presence of cystic areas and the ratio of cystic and solid portions. The echogenicity deals with the grayscale level of the solid part. How to categorize a cystic lesion? The first step in a nodule which has cystic areas is a visual judgment on the ratio of cystic and solid parts. If the solid parts prevails, then the nodule is solid. If the cystic content prevails, then the lesion is cystic. In the event of a cystic nodule, the next step is to judge whether the cystic content exceeds 90% or not. The left upper image presents a solid nodule, although it has tiny cystic areas, but the proportion of these is less than 5%, so this lesion is a solid or completely solid nodule. The cystic content of the left lower nodule is between 10 and 50%, so this is a predomin predominantly solid nodule. The upper right one and the right nodules are cystic because the cystic content exceeds 50%. The upper one is a predominantly cystic, while the lower one is an almost completely cystic lesion because the cystic content is above 90% in the lower case. Now let's see this part of the flow chart. I prefer to use the term cystic area for completely cystic lesions less than one centimeter in maximal diameter. In most cases, these are not pathological findings, but normally occurring dilated macrofollicles. There are two or three special forms of cystic nodules, the pure cyst, 
the almost pure cyst and the spongiform cyst. The left patient presented with numerous tiny cystic areas which should not be regarded as pathological findings or true nodules. The right nodules are examples of almost completely cystic nodules. These examples present an important and frequently misinterpreted situation. A spongiform pattern means an area which is composed of cystic areas separated by fibrous tissue. For example, here or there or here in almost the entire module. We can speak of a spongiform module if these spongiform areas exceed 50% of the module. The EU turrets is even stricter in definition. According to this, we can speak of a spongiform cyst only if the whole nodule consists of spongiform parts. Although the left nodules have areas with spongiform patterns, here and here and here, these do not fulfill the criteria of a spongiform nodule because these areas are clearly below 50%. In contrast to the right nodules are spongiform cyst. So not to change spongiform area or spongiform nodule. Now the final distinction, which primarily relies on dominantly cystic nodules, the differentiation between peripheral and central type cystic lesions is important because malignancy is significantly more common in peripheral type cysts than central type ones. The left central type cystic nodules are characterized by the presence of solid parts all along the inner surface of the nodule. So here is the inner surface and almost uh, where we can judge, we can see uh, solid parts here and in this event uh, here, this is uh, the solid part of the nodule. The nodule as a whole is this one and the, at the inner surface all along we can see solid parts. In the event of the right peripheral type cysts, the solid part emerges from one part of the inner surface. So here we cannot see any solid parts, it emerges from here. But now I turn to the next theme. The aspiration of cystic content frequently alters the subtype and the characteristics of the nodule. The left nodules seem to be a peripheral type cyst before aspiration, while after the removal of the fluid, it turned out that this lesion was indeed a central type cyst. You can see here all along uh, the inner surface, we can see uh, solid parts which was compressed by the cystic fluid. A seemingly pure cyst is presented in the upper right image. After the removal of cystic content, it turned out that the nodule had a significant amount of solid part. Here, this is the nodule that previously seemingly pure cyst, but this solid part was compressed by the cystic fluid. The next examples are the changes in nodule characteristics. The removal of cystic content frequently changes the echogenicity of the solid part and not infrequently makes the borders irregular. This situation is demonstrated by these nodules. Both the right and the left nodules have a regular border before aspiration, but the borders became irregularly lobulated after the removal of cystic content. Here is a lobulation, uh, here is a speculation, another speculation, Here's a lobulation, so this became, both cases became irregular. The right case demonstrates another change, the echogenicity of the solid part changed from almost normal to hypoechoic after the aspiration. This is caused by the well-known fact, the amplification of echocyanal dorsal to cystic fluid. So here is the cystic fluid and it is deceptively uh, more light uh, than it is. So solid part dorsal to fluid seems to be deceptively lighter than it is. Finally, I mention a practical issue, the judgment of intranodular echogenic figures. The removal of cystic fluid impairs their judgment. Before the aspiration, the upper image, 
The echogenic figures were clearly related to ventral cystic areas, here and here and here. Therefore, it was obvious that they were backward figures caused by posterior enhancement. Five, five months later, after the aspiration, some of these figures could be easily misinterpreted as microcalcifications because the cystic fluid has not reproduced. Here it is a doubtful figure, here and here again. We cannot see the cystic fluid which was present five months earlier. So how to deal with the above mentioned problems? I emphasize that these problems are absolutely neglected in the literature, so my suggestions summarized in the table, similarly to any other possible proposals, cannot be backed by literature data. On common sense, I think the echogenicity of the solid part and the type of cyst can be judged much better after aspiration. In the two other features, the borders and hyperechoic figures, the situation is just the opposite. The third theme is the echogenic figures related to cystic degeneration. The first is the cometary artifact. In a typical case, it is found in cystic fluid and the hyperechogenic granule has a characteristic narrowing tail. Unfortunately, the latter may be missing or the colloid crystal can be found in solid parts if the cystic content has absorbed. In these non-typical features, if these non-typical features occur simultaneously, then the differentiation of a cometary artifact from microclassification is very difficult or even impossible. In the left case, four cometary artifacts have characteristic tail. This one, this one, and here uh, next to uh, each other, two, one. These have this characteristic tail. The right uh, case represents those situations, then we lack characteristic tail. Here we can see, here again, but this this, this, and most of these uh, such uh, small echogenic granules uh, lack the characteristic tail. The other, the backward cystic figure, is indeed an optical artifact caused by posterior enhancement of the ultrasound wave. This is characterized by the synchronous presence of echogenic lines and granules and occur dorsal to cystic areas. Occasionally, granular forms prevail over linear form, which can cause a diagnostic issue. This is demonstrated by the right case. Here, this figure can be easily misinterpreted as a microclassification and also this one. But be aware that within the solid part, there are no such figures. Both of these figures are at the ventral surface, just dorsal of the cystic area. So we, this can be uh, regarded uh, quite surely as uh, backward figures. So the clue uh, is where are these granular forms located. Finally, some thoughts about the importance of cystic degeneration. It occurs in around 20% of thyroid cancers, primarily in papillary cancers. The presence of cystic degeneration decreases the likelihood of malignancy, but the practical importance of this fact is limited. It is worth mentioning that cystic degeneration is a strong, according to Sillery, the strongest negative predictor of follicular cancer. This observation has not only theoretical but also practical importance. Now I turn to the second part, to the discussion of nodule echogenicity. Three themes will be highlighted. First, the definition of nodule echogenicity. Traditionally, there are five types of nodules. In the order of decreasing lightness, hyperechoic, isoechoic, minimally, moderately, and deeply hyperechoic modules occur. We can discriminate between echogenicity uh, between echogenicities by using two reference tissues. The first is the normal thyroid. Nodules which are darker than the normal thyroid are classified as hypoechoic, while those with identical echogenicity are uh, grouped among isoechoic lesions, while nodules lighter than the normal parenchyma are hyperechoic nodules. 
The other reference tissue is the strap muscle running ventral to the thyroid, which serves to discriminate between minimally moderately and deeply hypergreek nodules. As you can see from the table, not five, but three categories are actually used. The right upper module is isoechoic, the, uh, pardon, uh, the left upper is isoechoic, the left lower is hyperechoic, uh, while the right nodules are hypoechoic. The right upper is moderately hypoechoic because the echogenicity is lighter than that of the strep muscle, while this module, the right lower, is deeply hyperechoic because the echogenicity is darker than the strep muscles running ventral to the thyroid. <clears throat> the nodule echogenicity is the most important one among suspicious features. The hyperechoic nodule belongs either to the worst or worst but one category. The thyroid systems differ whether they make distinction according to the degree of hypoechogenicity. The EU and the American Thyroid Association of Thyroids make this distinction, and in these systems, a deeply hyperechoic module must be categorized as high-risk module. In those systems which treat all hyperechoic lesions in the same way, hypochogenicity is the prerequisite to classify a nodule as high-risk one. This figure clarifies why is hypochogenicity so important. The sensitivity of this feature clearly emerges from the suspicious characteristics of the most frequent subtype of thyroid cancers, the papillary one. The situation is similar in medullary cancer. More than 80 to 90 percent of medullary cancers fuel in hypoechoic nodules. However, we must realize that follicular cancer behaves just the opposite as papillary cancer regarding all characteristics held as suspicious of papillary cancer, and this is particularly true for echogenicity. Yeh and co-workers have found that two-thirds of follicular cancers occur in isohyperechoic nodules. Finally, some problems regarding nodule echogenicity. The first is the issue of heterogeneous nodules. Heterogeneous nodule means that the nodule has isohyperechoic and hypoechoic parts as well. So a nodule which has minimally hyperechoic parts and deeply hyperechoic parts uh, is not heterogeneous. With the exception of the EU thyroids, all guidelines classify a nodule on the basis of the dominant echogenicity. In contrast, EU thyroids also classifies predominantly isoechogenic nodules based on the minority hypoechogenic part. Let's see an example. This was a follicular cancer. Two of the thyroids suggested finding the respiration, but the remaining three did not. So the handling of heterogeneous nodule is not only of theoretical, but also of practical importance. The second issue is one of the most important problems in thyroid ultrasound, the handling of nodule found in hypoechoic thyroid. It is worth discussing this problem in a little more detail. None of the three American guidelines takes note of this problem. On this approach, we must compare the nodule echogenicity to a deceased hypoechoic thyroid. If this approach is right, then we must, we must assume that the pre-existing thyroiditis also reduces the echogenicity of the nodule, moreover, to decreasing it proportionally. These, there is no one paper, there is no one data which would back this hypothesis. The current guideline acknowledges the existence of the problem and suggests what I have quoted. On the other hand, this system treats the nodules in the same ways as the three Americans based on an unproven assumption. The EU thyroids not only recognizes the problem but also tries to deal with 
Unfortunately, the suggested solution is equivocal, which is problematic regarding a uniform interpretation. Moreover, the suggested other solution, the comparison of echogenicity to salivary gland, does not solve the issue. Let's see an example, which again proved to be a follicular cancer. If we define normal thyroid as the external nodular tissue of the actual case, then we must compare the nodule echogenicity to the deceased hypoechoic external nodular tissue. Yes. Yes. Here we are. So uh, this is the deceased uh, hypertrophic thyroid, and in this case, uh, uh, if we follow the American suggestions, we have to compare the echogenicity of the nodule to the external nodular deceased part. In this case, we should regard it, the nodule as isohyperechoic, and no one thyroids would reveal the cancer. If the normal thyroid would mean a healthy thyroid, then the nodule would be a minimally moderated hypoechoic lesion, and two of the thyroids would give the chance to recognize the malignant disease. Be aware that all systems await from the investigator to compare the echogenicity of an actual thyroid to an imagined healthy one. So when we have to deal with the echogenicity of the external part, we have to imagine and not present a healthy thyroid, and we have to compare uh, the echogenicity of the thyroid, the non-modular part, to a healthy thyroid. It is strange and does not seem logical that we should proceed differently in the case of a nodule within the hyperechoic thyroid gland. In this context, the nodule should be compared not to a healthy thyroid, but to the extra nodular part. So the reference tissue of a normal thyroid is different in the event of nodules in hyperbaric thyroid than the extra nodular part. Regarding the extra nodular part, the reference tissue is an imagined healthy thyroid, while regarding the nodule, the reference tissue is the extra nodular part. It is awaited from us compare the non-nodular tissue to an imagined healthy thyroid by the event of the nodule, the guidelines suggest a different approach, a comparison to the extranodular tissue. I think that there are two forwarding options. The first is that we accept the suggestions of the guidelines and we compare the nodule echogenicity to the deceased hyperfit tissue, but in contrast to the suggestions, we should consider FNA in seemingly iso hyperechoic nodules. In my opinion, <clears throat> the solution for handling of nodules in hyperechoic thyroids is not very difficult. Similarly to the non-nodular tissue, in the event of the nodule, we should compare the echogenicity of a nodule to that of a healthy thyroid. Due to the passage of time, I only project the last three figures that speak from the, uh, for themselves. These are included in the presentations on the website and also will be available to view on the recorded version of this webinar. So, I finished uh, with this short 20 minute summary and I ask you whether you have questions or not. If some but it has question, please unmute yourself. You can ask uh, not only uh, about this short presentation, but also about uh, the manual and the pre-recorded uh, versions of these two topics, the composition and echogenicity. Uh, any questions? Uh, yes, um, I have a doubt uh, related with the, the mixed nodules with cystic component that you um, told that you aspire the component and sometimes the nodule, nodule changes. So what criteria do you use to um, submit those nodules to aspiration 
considering, for example, the the, the dimensions of, of the nodules. So we use the, the dimensions according to the guideline. You use the dimensions before the expiration, for example, or we have to see also not only consider the dimensions before, but also the how the model looks like after the expiration. So I, I have some doubts related with that process. Okay, thank you very much for the question. So a uh, nodule, a cystic nodule, which is smaller than one centimeter, uh, does not have uh, any uh, importance and no one guideline suggests aspiration cytology. If we meet a patient who has a larger cystic nodule, I think that uh, the forwarding approach is the following. First, we have to remove the cystic content, uh, and thereafter, in the second aspiration, we have to target the solid part. Uh, if uh, after the removal of the cystic content, the solid part uh, is larger than one centimeter or presents suspicious findings, hypogenicity, uh, microcalcifications, or irregular uh, uh, shape, then I think uh, we have to uh, perform a second aspiration targeting not the removal, but targeting the solid part. Uh, is it okay? My answer? Uh, yes, thank you. Just, but okay. we look basically at the, the, the solid part after aspiration, but imagine that you we have a nodule with 25 millimeters that has a cystic component and then we aspire. It goes to basically 15 with a solid part. Then we have to look at the solid part and imagine if it is hyperacogenic, for example, we don't submit that to biopsy, um, uh, despite the fact that he has 25 at the beginning. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm being clear. Uh, yes. Because the guidelines say that we, if we have like a mixed nodule, uh, and he has more than 20 uh, millimeters, right? Uh, it has uh, um, the, dim the dimensions to submit to biopsy. But if I take the, the, the fluid, the, the, the nodule shrinks, and then it goes smaller, right? And it in the second phase, it cannot have uh, the, 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 that uh, criteria for biopsy that it and in the first uh, time before aspiration. So I evaluate the nodule after aspiration or before aspiration regarding the dimensions. Uh, I, I don't know. That's my okay. doubt. Okay. okay. The, the point is you, 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 you uh, uh, highlighted uh, an important uh, uh, issue. Uh, I think uh, that a uh, final aspiration caused no harm to a patient. And as you will see in the following, uh, uh, in this uh, <clears throat> course, uh, I uh, do not agree uh, with the guidelines uh, that an iso high peripheric module should not be targeted because uh, we saw two iso high peripheric nodules both proved to be follicular cancer. So I think that uh, it uh, can be and uh, nowadays is is debated uh, by uh, two or three uh, articles presented uh, published in 2021 uh, that the turrets would be a useful uh, tool uh, to decide uh, on aspiration cytology. Turrets is very good uh, for uh, papillary cancer and also uh, to medullary cancer, but we fail many cases in follicular cancer. So, uh, sh shortly saying, I think that a nodule which is larger than one centimeter, even after uh, the aspiration, I target it, I make the aspiration. But the guidelines uh, uh, have the similar approach, but uh, do not uh, say in detail that after the aspiration or before the aspiration, when to judge uh, the solid part, I think uh, on the uh, suggestions of the guidelines, all nodules larger than 20 millimeter should be aspirated irrespectively of the uh, size of the solid part. Uh, there is another problem that uh, <clears throat> uh, a solid part, uh, even after the aspiration, <clears throat> is similar to a sponge. Uh, 
it is uh, it contains a relevant amount of uh, fluid we cannot see on the ultrasound but uh, uh, imagine a, a sponge uh, full uh, with water so if we aspirate the solid part of a previously aspirated cystic content so the cystic nodule after the removal of the cystic content the, the aspiration cytology not infrequently uh, will be non-diagnostic Thank you very other, much. Other questions? No other? Okay, then we move to the second part. Uh, but first I stop the recording. How to stop it?